Hello and welcome to the Sam Mobile Podcast. I'm your host Ben from Sam Mobile and welcome to episode 18 of your weekly Sam Mobile Podcast where we give you all the latest news in the world of Samsung within the week. And today's main topic will be that there is potentially a new mystery 200 megapixel sensor that should be coming in next year's Galaxy S23 series. On top of that, we do have potential press renders of the upcoming Galaxy A23 with the specifications that have also leaked as well. So we're going to pretty much run through that. And also QD OLED from Samsung Display winning awards as well, wrapping it up and we'll be discussing what that looks like. So as always, as we like to say, get your meal, get your drink, get your popcorn as it will be hopefully a good show. So kicking off the show, wherever you are listening or watching from, we highly recommend that you give us a follow, give us a rating and also turn on notifications and subscribe if you're watching it on YouTube or listening on Spotify or Anchor so you don't miss your weekly episodes as well. So yeah, it is going to be another Ben Solo episode. No special guest, no co-host, as you know, I don't have. So we're going to keep it short and sweet and um, pretty much hit these three topics and just see what that is in conjunction about. And first one is going to be yet again, surrounded around the 200 megapixel ISSL camera. Now, if you've not subscribed to the Sam Mobile TV YouTube channel, definitely we had to recommend that you do. We cover all things related to Samsung. And when it comes to the imaging sensors, it's something that we've kind of reacted to thoroughly when it comes to the HP1 and also the HP3. Uh, heavily discussed it also on the podcast as well with um, different special guests that have come. And um, I've shared my opinions, which I will go in again, but apparently we should be getting a mystery um, 200 megapixel sensor that should be coming hopefully for next year's Galaxy S23 series. And um, we'll look at the, um, we'll look at the article and pretty much break it down and see what's up with that. So this is actually as of the third, which was yesterday. We're recording this on the uh, on, 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 on the fourth, on the Thursday. So the podcast should go live the next day. And this was actually posted, there's, there's actually two, there's two articles. We'll go through the first one. This was actually posted on the third, which was on a Wednesday, yesterday, today's Thursday. And um, 200 megapixel ISSL sensor. Now we'll read this through pretty much on it. So Samsung has been using ultra high resolution cameras in its phones since the launch of the Galaxy S20 Ultra. The company used obviously the high, high resolution 108 megapixel sensors in the S20 Ultra and obviously on the S21 Ultra and where we are right now with the S22 Ultra. Now the company seems to be ready to graduate to a higher resolution sensors. Now, obviously this is something that we saw with them officially showcasing and announcing um, on their official YouTube channel, as well as obviously their blog post on their newsrooms. Um, you know, what they did with the billboard showcase with the HP one sensor, 200 megapixels, um, using a cat as the, you know, model portrait. Um, but it looks like according to, you know, leaks to ice universe that the Galaxy S23 Ultra will feature a 200 megapixel primary camera. Um, what it's saying is that the South Korean firm is reportedly using an unreleased 200 megapixel sensor, the HP two. Um, if you do remember, like we said, Samsung's first 200 megapixel sensor, um, which was the HP one was launched last year. And more recently, which we did a reaction to is that the company revealed that its second 200 megapixel sensor, the HP three. Now the HP two apparently will be a better performer than the HP one and the HP three. Yes. It's a bit confusing as it says right here, because obviously if you look at something like the ISSL GN two, it is a better sensor than the GN one but the GM5 is not as good as either of those. Now, if we're coming back to the ISSL um, HP2, uh, the size is not known yet, but however, uh, if it performs better, we could see a bigger sensor than the HP1, which is it's quite huge at one over 1.22 inch sensor will feature deeper, um, deep trench isolation technology. Experts are questioning Samsung's strategy over such a super high resolution cameras and using sensors of low resolution with bigger pixels theoretically could be better as well. Now, let's look at it here in this next one, which was literally directly posted after. Um, and it's apparently stating that, you know, the HP2 sensor, you know, could be, it could have a pixel size of 0 0.6 microns. Okay, very interesting. Now, you know, what this says is that there, there is a lot of speculation in regards to the next gen camera um, that Samsung are gonna be producing and using on its um, Galaxy S23 Ultra flagship phones. And we, we've been paying attention to how they've been showcasing the HP1 and HP3 sensors. Um, obviously the HP3 is much newer, 
Um, it's slightly smaller. It's meant to fit in more smaller devices, but still give high resolution. Um, they are in the 200 megapixel camera family. And also with what we saw again, HP2. Now, you know, if we look at the specification, the HP1 and HP3 have 0.64 micron pixels um, respectively for the HP1 because it's the bigger sensor and then 0.56 micron pixels for the HP3 as it is the smaller physical sensor. Um, and what that speculates is that HP2 is meant to sit in between at 0.6 microns. Now, the wider rumors, you know, were suggesting that it may feature a 450 megapixel camera, although it sounds a bit too much to be true, which obviously it is. Um, and according to other rumors, Galaxy um, S23 Ultra zoom camera might miss out on the upgrades. Interesting. Okay. Uh, whatever the case may be, there is a high probability that uh, Samsung's upgrading the S22 Ultra's main primary sensor to the 200 megapixel sensor away from 108. Um, the company avoided playing a high resolution game for years, but now it seems like they're dedicated to setting an example and crushing the numbers game again. Right. Okay. This HP2 sensor is uh, it's a very, very interesting place if that is really the case. Again, quick disclaimer, this is rumor territory. So take it with a pinch of salt, take it with a grain of salt, take it with whichever me measurement of salt that is manageable for you and um, see where it is right now. Now, HP2, if it's meant to sit in between, how is it meant to be a better performer? Well, what some of the rumors were actually saying when I was looking online is that uh, apparently the binning technology um, apparently is meant to be using something called hexabinning, where it's meant to be producing 35 megapixel images. But the main benefit, the main benefit, the main benefit is pretty much following in the steps from what I remember of the HP3. One of the things that the HP3 was um, showcasing was a wider field of view when shooting 8K video. Now, apparently, apparently, this is something that this HB2 is really meant to step up and bring. Not just the wider field of view, but, you know, sensor readout with resolution that is so much better that you could actually finally see 8K 60 frames a second with a wider field of view and good video stabilization. In simple terms, you could finally see actual usable 8K. Let's go back a moment, right? 4K, when 4K was announced first on smartphones, Samsung's first phone that did 4K, in my knowledge was the Galaxy Note 3. And I remember that vividly. I was working in telecommunications, retail selling phones at the time. And I remember one of the Samsung representatives came in and um, showed us the Note 3. And then yeah, 4K, I was like, wow, you know? And back then this was 2013, almost a decade later, back then, you know, we saw, we saw, um, well, definitely we saw 4K as kind of like a, a bit overkill for a smartphone, right? You wouldn't need that. But lo and behold, we are at a point where, you know, the bit rates, the resolution, the stabilization, the frame rate, you know, some phones are actually doing as much as 4K 120 when it comes to the slow motion. 4K 60 frames a second, especially on these flagship phones are near enough synonymous to, you know, the experience with excellent stabilization in different options, good colors, dynamic range, you name it, tick the boxes, we've almost near enough solidified just how stable um, the acquisition of recording in 4K UHD is, even on selfie cameras, right? Look at something like the Galaxy S22 Ultra, the selfie camera is stellar, it can shoot up to 4K 60 frames a second with video stabilization, which is great, right? With no compromise to HDR, good exposure. So this is something where progressively, a decade later almost, when we're seeing stuff about 8K being usable, it sounds a bit excess. It does. It is in a way, right? Especially on a smartphone where you're you're not you're not anywhere near the sensor size of APS-C, even micro four thirds, let alone full frame, right? So how is that really meant to just hold up when it comes to 8K, which um, requires no less than a 33 megapixel resolution to be able to acquire that? And again, this is where I'm seeing how this new um, um, pixel binning, this hexa, hexa binning, six way uh, pixel binning ratio does. Because if it's if it's producing 35 megapixel stills, 35 megapixels is literally the resolution that you need for 8K UHD. What that basically means is, by the looks of it, if this HP2 sensor is really bet what's meant to be, right? Yes, it's still below one micron pixel size in terms of the um, pixel size, which I will talk about that in terms of what we've seen currently. 
Um, it does. It does. It does mean that it sits well in between the two for the HP One and HP Three. If this new pixel bin in technology works as good as it is, that means high resolution, effective stills at thirty five megapixels, and the wider field of view as well, and high a higher frame rate. If the processing actually allows it with the ISP and the system on a chip, and of course stabilization. My biggest problem when shooting eight K is one is only available in 20 frame, 24 frames a second not 60, not 30. And also most of the time because of the resolution needed to be at least 35 megapixels, 33 megapixels, the other cameras lose out, i.e. ultra wide and the zoom, they lose out. And if you, if you consider it as well in that sense, when it comes to the performance of those, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's going to be interesting to finally, hopefully have more usable 8K because the crop and also the jello effect, i.e. rolling shot, as they call it, and also the lack of stabilization, those things just make it unusable above the fact that it is recording in 8K, right? It's a nice buzzword at this stage, but if we can actually see what this new apparent HP2 sensor is like when it comes to um, the pixel binning technology, the sensor quality, from what we're seeing in the micron pixel size, um, the, the 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 physical sensor size, and also just what it's going to be able to produce um, for video. As someone that really really finds video performance very important on these smartphones, right? It's not just for photos for me. I take a lot of videos on a regular basis um, in situations where you know I'm not using social media apps and their camera API and their camera UI to do it. You know, I'm recording within uh, the Samsung Galaxy app. Um, for the camera app and then posting it after to get the best quality possible. But sometimes it's just a quick turnaround, right? Double tap the double tap the power button and then you're pretty much in the camera ready to record, you know, and then you can just sort out the posting after which you can just stagger up. Um, this is something I experienced a lot. And, you know, you get access to features like video portrait mode and so many other different things, right? And video portrait mode although it does have a crop. It's 1080p and it's it's stable right so you're seeing these advances coming in and whatnot and that's that's one area that i'm eager to see if they can really get it right because those are the things that would actually draw people to actually want to use it and it would be a more usable experience so it's it's interesting if this is going to be called a hp2 how the naming system is a little bit weird in terms of how it stacks up um and um Samsung are really pushing 200 megapixels and super ultra high resolution. I want to touch on something for a moment, right? Because I'm I'm just questioning this again. I, I feel like we'll come back full circle in this situation nearly all the time when, you know, these new sensors get announced from Samsung. Um, I, I'm still questioning if this is the way to go. And, and, and I do have a bigger fear on autofocusing um, not just speed, but accuracy. It's not just about speed, but accuracy, right? With 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 such a large resolution in terms of megapixels and photo sites and whatnot, uh, I I just worry because it further moves them away from their dual pixel their dual pixel autofocus um technology, um and their super fast dual pixel autofocus technology, um, it moves away from that. And we know that that's been tried and tested since the Galaxy S7 series way back when as a very, very solid and strong solution to autofocus and just many other things in regards to that. So I see this and that's one of the things I worry about. The next thing I worry about, and I've stated this before, shutter lag. You know, I, I just I just worry that all this extra resolution, all this extra power processing when you're doing pixel binning, as well as so many other different things, um, will introduce some form of delay when capturing the image and saving it to your device. That is my point of concern. You know, they really, 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 really cannot go through what happened with the S20 Ultra again. Um, and, and for that reason, almost makes me feel like I would take the lower resolution on the same sensor size, as well as making sure that, you know, you, 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 you've got... Um, the bigger pixels at the low resolution, but at the same large sensor size, as close to one one inch as possible, right? I still think that is still the better way to go. I, I think Samsung's ploy here 
is the numbers game. You know, I think the, 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 the old school numbers game has touched them again. They haven't been in this resolution, you know, war for a while. And then now it's just like, they really want to use it as an example. Um, you know, pixel binning, oversampling, uh, rolling shutter, all these things really concern me when it comes to, you know, uh, this size. And, and I'll be dead serious with you. Like I said, you you don't need any more than a 48 megapixel or 50 megapixel sensor for the main, just to accommodate for the fact that the aspect ratio and the recording width horizontally and vertically for, for 8K UHD, you know, is around 33.3 megapixels to 35 megapixels, give or take. So, yeah, it's 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 going to be interesting. The S23 Ultra will definitely get a generational change because the 108 megapixel sensor that's in here, although slightly different than the S22 Ultra, it's their third generation. It's their third generation as you had it in the S20 Ultra. You also had it in the... Uh, we also had it in the, ah, my mind's just gone blank. No 20 Ultra, S21 Ultra, which is obviously my favorite, and S22 Ultra, which is what we have right now in this year. So it's um, it's it's definitely going to get an upgrade. But how is it going to be laid out? So here's where my thoughts are. Here's where my thoughts are. I feel like it's going to be staggered. I feel like the HP3 will be in the smaller S23 and S23 Plus, and I think they're still going to stick with the HP1. I think it's still gonna be stick with the HP one. What I don't want Samsung to do is flip and reverse it. Now that apparently the parody is meant to be X, um, not X, but, um, meant to be Snapdragon chipsets in all their smartphones. I don't want them to be switching different main sensors, right? Because of availability and stuff. We need absolute parody this time, right? And um, I think this will be the case. I think that will be the case. I think that'll be the case. I think that'll be the case personally. I might be wrong. I might be wrong, but I think that might be the case. So HP1 on the main, HP3 on the S23 Plus and S22. If it may be when HP1, HP2 on the S, HP1 on the Ultra, HP2 allegedly rumored on the um, S23 Plus, and then, you know, the smaller sensor size goes into the smaller device, which being the S23, and pretty much align it there. And obviously, as the S22 Plus and S22 have, you know, 50 megapixel sensors on a main, more than enough resolution, right? And we're expecting it to be the same follow-up when it comes to those three. But the eyes will literally be on the S23 Ultra and what's been discussed about with this. Now, again, given an opinion, I, I think I think it's still, it's still up in the air. It's still up in the air. I know there's been a lot of demonstration. I'm seeing, you know, people that I know on billboards showcasing the 200 megapixel sensor blown up around. It's great. It's great. But you've got to consider, and especially when I did the first breakdown reaction video of them doing that, you've got to consider the type of equipment that they're putting in front in terms of lens optics to give you that. Yeah, it's it's a it's a lot, it's a lot different. It's a lot different. It's way, way, way different. It's way, way different. So just consider that. Just consider that. But we could surprisingly see the HP2 200 megapixel sensor, 0 0.6 micron pixel size, sitting nicely in between the 0 0.56 and 0 0.64 of the HP1 and HP3. And also could be getting a bigger sensor size than a one over 1.22 inch of the HP1. Very interesting. We'll see how that goes. If there is any official announcement on Samsung's website or YouTube channel, we'll be sure to react to it and give you our thoughts and opinions. That is topic one out of the way. Yes, we're going to take a short water break. Then we're going to actually look at the potential press renders of the Galaxy A50, uh, A A23, sorry. <laughs> I was saying A53. Been saying a lot of that film recently. And see what it's about alongside apparently the specifications as well. So yeah, I'm going to have a quick water break. Don't go too far. Be right back. And we are back. Hope you didn't go too far. I tried not to. Yes, I'm rehydrated and ready to recharge. So topic number two will be on apparently the press renders and the specifications have pretty much leaked in regards to the Galaxy A23 5G. Hmm, okay. One thing I will definitely say is that please, Samsung, can we start removing the 5G on the names of your smartphones? Or are you still doing 4G variants of these phones as well? Because to my knowledge, I'm thinking all your phones are 5G now, you know, but that's been a bit, but again, that's just my thoughts and opinion. But uh Galaxy A53. Now, 
ACVs is an interesting lineup because we had predominantly the A53 and the A33 as of April. We covered the hands on. Unfortunately, we didn't get any review in it, so we weren't able to test you know things that we like to test, i.e., the display quality when it comes to things like also um, you know the camera performance, especially charging test, and also just a general feel of the phone when it comes to the performance when using it day to day. Um, especially with that new Exynos 1280 chipset that they were really pushing in that device with the A53, A33, and also I believe the A73, but want too many details because the A73 was meant to be and is 108 megapixels. But I think we did do um, some reviews on the website with the written articles. Um, so yeah, it's 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 pretty much there, I guess. But let's switch over and let's have a look at it, man. So. Here is what we're seeing right here. More official Galaxy A53 5G press renders and specifications leak. And uh, we'll give it a quick read and breakdown as this. Amid all the recent leaks concerning Samsung's next compact event on the 10th, the A53 has popped up online again through unofficial channels, leaked renders, and now have revealed the overall design and color options and also have a full list of spe specifications to look through. Samsung's upcoming super low cost, low cost phone features a 6.6 inch full high definition plus display and a quad camera combo, including a 50 megapixel primary sensor with OIS, 5 megapixel ultra wide, 2 megapixel depth, and 2 megapixel macro. Oh dear lord. The 2 megapixels have struck again. <laughs> the selfie camera has an 8 megapixel resolution and it's embedded in an Infinity V. Infinity V? Yeah, Infinity V. Infinity V notch. <laughs> Okay, so the A53 5G does boast 25 watt fast charging, although Samsung's um, Galaxy A um, low cost phone, um, it does have characteristics of its more expensive phone, such as a 5G connectivity, 25 watt charging, aside is 50 megapixel main sensor of um, OIS. Now in terms of the hardware, what we are seeing is that it should be sip sipping with four gigs of RAM, avoid, six gigs of RAM, yep, eight gigs of RAM, cool. Um, and 64 gigabytes or 128 gigabytes of internal storage. And it should be able to be expanded with the micro SD card up to an additional one terabyte. And apparently other specs would be Bluetooth 5.1, Android 12, One UI 4.1, and a Snapdragon 695 chipset rather than the Dimensity solution for MediaTek. Yeah, Samsung will release this device in at least four different colors, blue, um, what was it? Black, blue, pink, gold, and white all of which can um, you can see in the image below. And um, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. Apparently in Europe, it should be launching around 300 euros. Okay, so we've got some of the colors there. So our, 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 our video watchers can pretty much see what's up. Blue and there, I like this color. And obviously the blue, oh, the white one is nice and clean as well. White one is nice and clean as well. So standard procedures. Uh, in regards to what we have here and here's here's my take on it uh the display i'm worried that the display is going to be lcd <laughs> or tft or film thin film transistor uh, or lcd which is obviously liquid crystal display i have a feeling it's not going to be amoled it's not going to be any oled based because I, I just think the po the cost but i might be wrong um I really wish they just didn't use the two megapixel depth sensors. And I really, 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 really wish that two megapixel macro was just embedded into the ultra wide. Really just need to move away from that. But I guess aesthetically, they do that to kind of fill the camera bump that we see there. So there's like a design parity in that sense, right? So chucking the cheap lenses. Um, I will say this, that Samsung's 25 watt charging on their mid-range phones don't behave the same way as their flagship phones. There is still a variation. The flagship phones are a lot, lot more efficient with the 25 watts, especially in their 5,000 milliamp hour battery. You go back and watch any of our charging test videos on the Galaxy S21 Ultra as well as the S22 Ultra. Those 5,000 milliamp hour batteries with the 25 watt charging that they use, yeah, it really just does make a difference in that sense, right? So... I'm thinking maybe it's going to be LCD. Um, obviously, the fast charging, I think it will take about an hour, 20 minutes, an hour and 15 minutes. Um, if you look at our charging test video of the Galaxy S21 FE, I believe, yeah, it should be somewhere reminiscent to how that phone behaves. Um, I did initially say that avoid a four gigabytes of RAM, but obviously RAM plus, this could be where 
the feature of One UI 4.1 could start making sense with RAM Plus. Because if you allocate an additional four gigabytes of your internal storage, yes, virtual RAM using your internal storage is not as fast as, and as immediate as random access memory, proper RAM, right? Um, we don't know what type of speed RAM is going to be using, whether it's using LPDDR4, LPDDR4X, or LPDDR5. But um, RAM Plus couldn't help negate the performance drops when it comes to using four gigabytes of RAM on Android now, especially on Android 12, and especially on One UI 4.1, with how much features One UI has, especially with all the duplicate apps for like, you know, calendar, all these other different things like calculate and stuff. So if you take that into account, it's interesting. Why didn't they use MediaTek? I, I think I think Samsung has a thing against MediaTek if I'm gonna be dead be honest with you because I don't think they really wanna to touch them. <laughs> um, they have a strong relationship with Qualcomm. Um, the Snapdragon 695, um, again, it's probably not for me. It's not that I can't use mid-range phones. Oh yeah, I can use mid-range phones actually, but I just have a distinct experience and, and, and a big asterisk against the A53 because I've not actually used it, put my SIM card in it, smart switch, used it day to day to really get a feel. But the experience that the A52 left me last year and I didn't get to use the A52S um, was not good, was not good. It was a spec sheet tick box exercise that did not optimize well. And for the price, other phones within the same price range were doing things a lot better with less. Um, but it's A50, A23, it looks all right. It looks all right. It looks decent. I think it's accessible. Um, do I think 300, 300 euros makes sense for the price? No, maybe 250. Um, but again, you do have devices like the A03, um, the A13 that's there. So it's got to sit somewhere. And again, this is typical Samsung t tactic of hit every category while you can. Every price point, every category and just milk it where everyone has access to a Samsung device. So they pretty much have the One UI experience and the services that Samsung offers in the open, open, um, open ecosystem, as they like to call it. But yeah, that was pretty much a quick fire round of it, man. The Galaxy A53 5G um, looks okay, looks decent. Few concerns, potentially LCD. Um, and also the RAM management as well. Um, and also the price difference that will be but it is great to see micro, uh, micro SD card expandability is still staying true on the Galaxy A series and the price mm, could be questionable. And I do love the colors as well. But yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Wrapping it up and wrapping it in. We are pretty much going to go into the final leg after another short break. We'll be talking about QD OLED really doing well when it comes to test results in TV performance. And this is a good sign of their first generation QD OLED. And we're talking about Samsung display this time and what that could mean for shifting the tide against the standards of micro mini LED, as well as, of course, OLED from its competition. Don't go too far. We'll be right back. And we are back. Yes, we are back. The final leg. And we are going to be talking about all things display in relations to Samsung Display. And we know the new breakthrough innovation that they really put through with the QD OLED technology. Samsung finally implementing their version of OLED on their TVs. And we've been synonymous with them when it comes to their OLED tech on their smaller screen devices all the way up to their tablets. But yeah, QD OLED is really setting the grounds. Um, Again, quick backstory if you guys are here listening for the first time. I did get a chance to obviously go to CES to see at Las Vegas uh, back in person again, finally after two years with the crazy stuff that we've gone through and um, finally got to see the QD OLED displays in person or obviously as they like to call it then QD display, but it's really QD OLED in terms of marketing and what they're seeing there, which is is, is better than just calling it QD display. Um and it's really meant to really be setting things up in terms of, you know, luminosity in each individual color channel, as well as obviously general brightness as well. Um, combating things like um, burning and just having high sustained brightness, HDR, and, you know, just, just better drive in terms of, you know, more vibrant and accurate colors as well in terms of the luminosity. And it was very interesting. Again, we definitely recommend you check our QD display or QD OLED video. Um, explained um, uh, a video on what that is. Uh, but yes, it looks like there's been some news in terms of 
just the performance of QD OLED. So Samsung's QD OLED panel bags top honors in ultimate TV shootout. Very, very interesting. I love me a good shootout, right? Um, in this in this year's TV shootout conducted by the Valley Electronics via Tech Radar, just outside of New York City, the Sony XR A95K won the best 4K TV award. An award was bestowed upon Sony by the TV tester experts and you know, deduce that the A95K is the best amongst the rest. And um, this is really just down to the fact that it does use Samsung's QD OLED panel that was unveiled earlier this year in January. Uh, Valley Electronics has been hosting a TV shootout event for almost two decades, but because of the pandemic, it was canceled in 2020. All the top contenders were put into the room and, you know, calibrated with their maximum picture quality. So all TVs get their playing field. The top performer is crowned... Um, king of tv and maker of the tv gets an award and obviously with sam you know sony's qd OLED tv being in the first place and the cat testing category was closely followed by samsung electronics own s95 b qd OLED tv which also uses the same technology as the sony xr 95 a95k however lg's g2 oled was also close to sony's qd oled hinting that the regular OLED is still a viable contender, but the future of the TV technology will be pretty much put in together where we're seeing OLED versus QD OLED really going at it. Interesting that Sony winning the award, um, it's the most expensive 4K TV that you can buy, which is understandable, and it is next-gen tech. At just half the price, the S95B looks to be a great deal, and it's going to be very interesting. Um, let's... Let's see something where Samsung S95B TV OLED UK. Just want to see something. Wow, they've they've dramatically dropped this this in price. I didn't realize. Okay, let's have a look at this. Let's have a look at this. Um, wow, I didn't realize that the price has dropped that much. Uh, let's go to no. Just wanted to check something in regards to the pricing. So I remember when this initially came out, this was a lot higher. I believe this was priced around £2,600. Wow, that's come down a lot in price and I was not expecting that. What's the 65-inch model saying? Okay, the 65-inch model is still up there, right? 3Gs. Um, and um, wow, okay, interesting, interesting, interesting. So that there is there is a considerable price difference. This is good for QD OLED. QD OLED looks to be starting strong out the gate. It looks to be starting strong out the gate and it looks for first generation display technology. Um, it seems to be really doing more than the job. And it looks like the differences between obviously what the panel can do is really down to just an internal process in between Sony and Samsung, right? When it comes to, you know, what they do. And regardless, it looks like the panel really just has the leveraging headroom. All we need to do now is we just need to get the price down, man. And also for those that really want a super sleek design of their Neo series, especially their QD, um, you know, AQ, QLED um, Neo series, it's really something that they need to really get that sleek looking design back into there as well. It still does look great, don't get me wrong. But yeah, those those Infinity, um, Infinity design um, bezels that they've got on there are really, really good. And also the bigger size frames. Obviously, you only have this in 55 and 56. Again, for me, I've got a 48-inch OLED TV. Um, for my office bedroom space, it works fine. But 55-inch, yep, yeah, kind of generic size, 65-inch. But there are some people that really do look towards the 75 and the 83s and sometimes the 100-inch ones. And again, this is where uh, established OLED panels really have gone up to those bigger sizes. So we need to get it there. And again, um, economy of scale should hopefully kick in once things come into their stride with what QD OLED is being offered in terms of what Samsung display have. I still remember my first time seeing it and I still want to try it. I don't, I have no need. TVs are a very strange one where, you know, it's just a very strange one, right? But what we are hoping is that we will hopefully somehow get these in on a temporary basis to check them out and see what's up. And, um, and really just get to see it in person. When I say get to see it in person, again, I've got an Xbox Series X. I've got a PlayStation 5. Fortunately, both, you know, really, really good next-gen consoles. 
and you know with streaming services and also like your computers and stuff to really get an experience you really want to sign into like your netflix your disney plus your amazon primes right see how the streaming services behave with you know hdr content as well as obviously with hdr content and just the brightness and obviously how it deals with the colors and just you know your favorite tv shows your movies your animations and stuff right but gaming how does it really respond you know, and this is where the internal processing and things like feature sets and whatnot really come into play. Um, one of the things, obviously, with the Samsung um, electronics based um, S95B is the lack of support for Dolby Vision HDR, things like that, right? Which you get on the competition panels as well. And how that affects um, your viewing experience, because it is becoming the industry standard when it comes to things like that. But again, the price coming down as heavily as it is, I suspect... I might even low-key pick this up when it comes to Black Friday if they really reduce it close to a thousand pounds, which I can see it happening because I didn't expect the price to drop as quickly as it's dropped right there. But yeah, these still are expensive panels for good reason. But at least for a first generation panel, it looks to really be doing the job. And it looks like, you know, what Samsung Display have got and what they've introduced with QD OLED looks to really be doing the job. So I'm interested to see how the development really goes. But apart from that, man, that is pretty much it for your episode 18 of the sound mobile podcast hope you enjoyed it indeed indeed as we always say give us a follow give us a rating give us feedback and let us know how you would want things to go and if there's any specific topics that you want to discuss as always we'll always aim to try and get special guests on here um and yeah pretty much away from that as always we like to say that do save do stay safe during this time we'll catch you in the next one peace